Welcome back to the show that Founder UK is doing on the Word of God. And what we're going to do in this particular show is looking at the text of Islam. So that's primarily the Quran and the text of Christianity. And that's prime, well, that is the Bible. Um, so we're really going to zero in on the text. We did talk a little bit in the last show about what is the text and who is the text, which of course is, uh, or who is the word of God, which is the biblical position. But right now we're going to look at the actual written word, the written text. Muslims say that is the Quran, the word of God is the Quran, and uh, Christians say uh, the word of God, the written word of God is the Bible. So Paul and Jay, welcome back. And mm -hmm. Paul, you are someone who loves to research the Bible, um, church history, the text of the Bible, what it teaches us, who it points us to. Jay, you love to um, also do that, but mm. also look at the Quran in, in quite a lot of detail. Mm. You've got some really exciting research to um, talk through today, don't you? Mm. Um, do you want to maybe just introduce very briefly, not in detail, but very briefly, some of the latest findings that researchers have found on the Quran that isn't really out there in the general um, population yet? Yeah, I don't know how, when you say briefly, you can't really do it briefly. <laughs> I, I, what, what I will say is when, when Muslims talk about this book here, the Quran, they're talking about something, uh, they're, they're, they're saying something that's totally different than what we're saying. Let's start from that right away. Because when we talk about the Word of God, the, lit, the written Word of God, we're talking about something that was created by men on earth, written by men yeah. on earth. In fact, we know many of the men who wrote it. We give names yeah. to the different books that they wrote. That, so we start from a totally different position. This is not something that's eternal. No. Whereas this book here is eternal for Muslims. Immediately, you can see we're talking about two different things. Yeah. They believe that this is, and the Quran itself makes that injunction. It says so in chapter 85, verse 22 of the Quran, referring to the preserved tablets, which every exegete suggests are these eternal tablets. Now, right there, you can see there's a problem with duality, because uh, yeah. how can you have God and His Word co-eternal? You're, 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 you have a duality, two eternal things. Immediately, that's, uh, that jumps on the whole notion of the oneness of God. And we also know that Muslims themselves, especially back in history, have debated this the yeah. problem the already. The so it's not out. something we century, raise yeah. up. It is and a Muslim And they were all killed issue. for yeah. that. For, and that's yes. where ijtihad then was shut down. But this, that notion... Explain what ijtihad is. Yeah. Uh, which means, interpret really, it, it means interpretation of scripture was shut down no more interpretation of scripture was shut down for a thousand years your reinterpretation yeah a more individual interpretation exegesis yeah. is what we would call today the technical name so that was then reopened in 1905 by muhammad abdu at al-azhar university which means we can now do that today and we are but let's let's start with this notion that this is eternal this book is not eternal no. this is written by men inspired mm. by god mm. but so we're starting with a totally different claim the other thing they all say is that it was therefore had to be sent down via some intermediaries jibril or gabriel the angel gabriel to a man named muhammad now here's the first question right out there if it had to be sent down to a man named muhammad this character in the seventh century why is it that god in his wisdom sent it to a man who couldn't read and write yeah there's the first question you need to ask and why would he send it down in a language that couldn't even accommodate the text? Remember, Arabic had no diacritical marks. That means the dots above and below the lines. It had no vowelization. Mm. It was not really a text that could have accommodated anything that this book needs or any revelation needs. God already had sent this book in Hebrew and in Greek. Mm -hmm. He already had languages at his disposal. Why would he then create and send it to a man who couldn't read or write, and then to on a referring to an Arabic text, mm -hmm. a, a language that didn't even have a literate uh, uh, illiteracy yet? There yeah. was no literature that we know of outside of the suspended poems of Umar al Qais. That's it. We don't know of anything from the seventh century borrowed from another language called Nabataean language, which in and of itself would have been superior to the Arabic. So mm -hmm. these are questions that I've never heard a Muslim answer. But then take it so the next step. So it's a fairly step. new language. The Quran has been sent Arabic down. Arabic did not exist prior to the fourth language, century, there which were, means who, who God wouldn't have even been speaking Arabic, um, actually, because no. the language didn't exist. So he didn't need to speak the language. I mean, God can speak all mm. languages, but God doesn't. Yeah, the, it doesn't make sense, doesn't make sense yeah. that this is the what the the sort of holy language is. And then on top of that, why would he send it to a man living in a place that didn't even exist for another hundred years? Mecca didn't even exist in the seventh century. And that's where uh, all the archaeology really? is pointing. We towards. don't have any yes. reference yeah. to the city that this man came from until 740, and he died in 632. Mm. 
Put Don't that worry, under your hat. Yeah, okay. So can you see, these are huge historical questions that we're asking and we need to ask. But then on top of that, when he finally sent it down to this man named Muhammad, if he did so over that 22 year period, uh, lunar years, then you got to ask the next question, why didn't he write it down? Muhammad. And certainly we know his early companions even debated whether it was right that he wrote it down. But he didn't. Mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. no Muslim I know today, no scholar would say it was written down. It was memorized by his companions. Uh, it was written on bones, stones, pieces of bark, things like that. That we do have from the traditions. And Jay, which, which text was memorized Hold there? on a minute. We're, you're jumping oh, yeah, ahead. Okay. I see you want to get yeah. ahead. But <laughs> can you see? I mean, Just that, now yeah. stop and think. We don't have this yeah. problem with the Bible, do no, we? No, no, not at all, yeah. We know it was written down almost immediately. Well, it's written down immediately, and by contrast, this book tells you that there's all these human authors writing it, no. and Jesus himself says, oh yeah, Moses wrote this, or David wrote this, or Isaiah wrote this. So he, you just list all these human authors who did it, and then inside the Bible itself, it talks about copying it from this manuscript to that manuscript, and Jeremiah has like a secretary who writes it all out for him, and things like that. So that pr very human process of having documents and writing them down onto documents and people carrying them around and passing them on. That's all part of this book. The notion that it was in an eternal form and then just gets sort of teleported down somehow is inconceivable. It's written over, you know, at least 1,500 years. And what language yeah. did it use? Now, yeah. Hebrew, but let's talk with the New Testament. Well, multiple. Really, no, he, multiple. Yeah, Hebrew and Aramaic in the, and then the Greek. But let's, yeah. let's talk about that because really yeah. the, the Muslims are not really attacking the authority of the Old Testament. They're attacking the authority of the New Testament. Let's just deal with those two to make it more simple. So what language did the writers write it in? Yeah, so the New Testament is written basic, almost certainly all in Greek. Why? Why is it in Greek? Because they were not Greek speakers, they were mostly Aramaic speakers, weren't they? Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, there's, it's possible that Matthew's Gospel may have been written Aramaic, but basically it's Greek because of that. And all these quotations from the Old Testament are put into Greek, which again is very interesting, because there's that idea that this thing called this Word of God, this message, is in Hebrew, in Aramaic, in Greek, from Greek all over this world, Mediterranean Why? In Greek world. Again? You don't, yeah. I, I want the answer. What is the reason for Greek? Well, because Greek is that common language of so, the Mediterranean so world. So everybody could read it. So everyone could read it. So in why? The in, Even what? into India, people spoke Greek. Now, can yeah. you see the contrast yeah. there? This is written in a language that nobody knew. Oh, yeah, I get your point. Nobody yeah. could use. Yeah. So what in the world would they yeah. put it in a language that hadn't yet reformed? It okay. didn't really have the access. It didn't have any accessibility to any written text yeah. for another hundred years yet. Oh, that's a massive point. Let me just piggyback on that slightly then. Now I get what your point is. Because even with the Old Testament text in 300 BC, you know, and Alexander the Great, everyone knows yes. Alexander the Great, and he set up Alexandria in Egypt, this super famous city, and the first thing he said is, I want the greatest library in the world here, and so the famous library of Alexandria. And then when he was making it, he appointed this disciple of Aristotle to be the first librarian. And, one, and they said, right, what are the books we've got to have? And they said, oh, we need those like Hebrew scriptures of the Jewish people, but we need to translate them into Greek. So they paid enormous amounts of money to translate them all into Greek in 300 BC in order that everyone would be able to there read it. it. See, that's what I love about the Bible. Yeah. The Bible was created for, with the notion yeah. it was going to be a missionary for text yeah. for everybody, yeah. not just for one people. That's right. For the whole world, not just for one world. And because yeah. God speaks every language, yeah. God hasn't it's got an issue with that. Yeah. In fact, he's sort of the one that introduced languages way back many thousands of so years ago. So already we're seeing there's a huge difference huge between difference. these two books. And is this true? You'll help, help me clarify this. Uh, when I talk to my Muslim friends, they'll say, well, this isn't a translation. Because even the notion of translation, yeah, the interpretation. Of the See, noble, actually, of the meaning. The meaning. Even, the, there the, is no, it you cannot have to be translated. Because in this book, there is Greek New Testament quotations, basically translations of things from the Old Testament. So in this book, the whole notion that the same message can be in lots of different languages mm -hmm. is intrinsic to this book. There you as go. if it's saying, now go ahead, put it into any language you want. Okay. Because it's, I'm going to throw right. this right back on your lap, oh. Ian, because why do you think that they say this is, cannot be translated? Yeah, Remember get, what the what? Catholic Church did? Right. The Catholic Church kept it in, in, in Latin, Latin Vulcan, so only yeah. the priests could read it. Yes, they didn't right. want laity to read it. Right. In the same way, the Muslims are doing the same thing with this. They don't really want you to read this.
But surely they, but why have it the interpretation ah, of the meaning? What's that? So, about? anytime you read it and you find yeah. a problem, verse, oh, well, that's not in the Arabic. You have to go to the Arabic. Yeah, I've had people do yeah, that yeah. Why do they many, do that? Because they say that's the way, that's just a quick get out. You cannot translate it. Therefore, you don't ever, you will never know the meaning. Therefore, the only ones who really know the meaning are the ones who speak Arabic. Now, stop and ask, how stupid is that? If you want this to be every, every, if only the Arabs and the scholarly Arabs can loan it, then how can this be a universal book for all people and all peoples and all time? That's impossible. But even when you do read it in your own language, and even when Arab speakers read it in Arabic, there's still quite a lot they don't understand, or it doesn't really relate to them today. Or it goes against what many of your more modernist, um, sort of liberal Arabic Muslims want to live by. So when they read, finally do read that in their own language, they find that this text yeah. doesn't represent the life or the kind of life that they want to live okay, today. Okay, let's take that and yeah. apply that. Let's use yeah. that one example. Chapter 47, verse 46, talks about jihad. Yeah. And those who, in fact, it starts with verse 4, cut off the heads of the unbeliever. Wow. And those who participate in jihad and shall die in jihad, great will be their reward in heaven. Now that is not a relevant verse for today. You don't cut off the heads of the non-believers, and if you do so and you get killed, then you're gonna go straight to heaven. You can see a problem with that. That's yeah. certainly not a defensive uh, act. So that is very yeah, aggressive That's act. what they wanna do. They try to spin it, and yeah. they say, well, you don't understand the Arabic. Or one that you get all the time, chapter four, verse 34, where it says that a man is uh, controls over his wife, but those wives that stand against their husbands, first admonish them, then throw them to bed, then, then beat them. Daraba is the Arabic word, means beat them, scourge them. Well, they have to put in parentheses lightly. Well, the most recent Qurans that you get on the streets, certainly in London, yes. say at book tables that Muslim missionaries will put around the city yes. or in other places across Europe, um, that particular uh, word has been taken completely out completely of out. the newest and the latest. Um, beat them is not there any longer. Yes, texts that are used in Dahwa, in Islamic mission. So can you see the difficulty? Wow. That's yeah. why then they have to put interpretation of the, yeah, meaning. the meaning. They don't want you really to go to the text. Because no. this book is so irrelevant. Yeah. It is so, it has, it's so problematic for yeah. Muslims. Where, whereas we yeah, know. We're the opposite. We're we, we want everybody yeah. to read it. I mean, you yeah. look at Wycliffe and all these yeah. Bible translators. What, we have it in 2,500 yeah. languages now. Uh, in 93% of the world's population now can yeah. read and this book in their known and, native tongue. Just for what reason? Yeah, for what? Because we want everyone to read it. We and have nothing to hide. Last night, I was in a McDonald's getting a drink with someone, and we had like a New Living translation out. And there was a lady just came and joined. Us, and then she says, what's this? Yeah, and then we were like this and said, look at, read that. And she was reading it just straight out like that. And we were all excited because we, and we were in Isaiah or, and then we were in Numbers and we we're all over the Bible. And we just had absolute confidence. There's nothing better than for her to read it for exactly. herself in simple language. And we and want actually, everybody to read it in yeah. their native tongue so they can understand it because we're yeah. not embarrassed well, by no. it. Because yeah. there's nothing that I would, that I cannot defend in the yeah, New Testament. I'm sticking with the New Testament right now. Yeah. We're not going to get the old yet, but the New Testament, when you, because these two, would, when you look at yeah, it, we yeah. already found two different differences already. Yeah, huge. Now you want another one. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, go, go for another one. We're going to do like and like, bunch of back and forth. Let's go with the whole notion that we don't have the original text. Oh, That's yeah. the other thing that comes out. Beth, remember, we used to get this all the time at Speaker's Corner. Well, uh, the claim is that we don't have the original text of the Bible, but they, they believe that they do have the original of the Quran, which latest research, of course, has shown that's not true. In fact, um, we have four of the earliest Qurans don't steal my in thunder, our library right, right here. Yeah, but, don't steal my thunder. <laughs> Didn't you just say, though, it was bones and bark and things like that? I don't understand okay. what... What, how's so he's that been listening. Work? He's been yeah. listening. So isn't the original text then is like a bag of rubbish? Okay, it but first, before like. before we get into that, do we have the originals for this? Well, well we, we don't have the originals. We have all say that again, so they all hear you. They, we don't have the originals. We never this. make that claim. It's the most ancient no one text. ever claims that. Well, yeah. um, historians don't have the originals no, of, of the ancient of the ancient yeah. writings from um, uh, thousands of years ago. Yeah. So why do they expect we have the um, er earliest and um, I want you originals to say that of on, the Bible? On film yeah. So people can hear you. Yeah. Because there is this notion that Muslims believe that we're saying that. We're not no, no. saying that. Like, okay, let me really clearly state it. Like, the, we don't have anything even close to an original manuscript of these things. The things that, like, you can go into the British Library and you can see, like, Jane Austen 
and like uh, actual handwritten copies of novels that people wrote in the 19th century. Yeah, Ricky Dicky Tarvey by Roger Ricky Kipling. Ricky I love that one. Yeah, you can go and see these things. And so I, I suppose, so, I don't know if pe but people maybe imagine you could go and see Matthew's Gospel and at the end it's like, by Matthew. And like, <laughs> sign, and he's a regional. No, there's nothing even approximately like that. So we're taking that stance for the very beginning. That but that's the, the very case for every ancient literature. There's all no ancient original literature. of Aristotle. There's no original no, well, of Herodotus or Tacitus and I all use these the early Julius writers. Caesar is a good example because his conquest of Gaul, it's like everyone knows that book. It's one of the most famous ancient texts. The earliest example of, of a copy of it is 700 years after he's it yes. was written. Yeah. And yet nobody would question. No, some people say maybe he didn't write it, maybe he paid someone to do it for him. But 700 years later. Well, her, well she mentioned Herodotus yeah. and Thucydides. Yeah, that's that's 400 BC. We don't have anything for 1400 years. Okay, that, I mean, that's even. And yet yeah, you cannot, and nobody doubts you can't look at history yeah. without going yeah. to Thucydides or Herodotus to know yeah. about the ancient world. Yeah. No one, that even doesn't even come up whenever you study those. I've never heard anybody question the authorities. Oh, no, nobody has. What's incredible about the Bible? Yeah. So, so on the one hand, okay, we don't have the actual papers that Matthew wrote on. And he did write on sort of papyrus and things like that. It wasn't bits of bark and stuff like that. It was actual papyrus people did. But so, so explain why that's important. Well, that's really important because these are like actual... Because, for example, the way Luke begins... When well, wh why is papyrus? Spell? Oh, because uh, papyrus is... What's wrong with that? Oh, okay. Well, first of all, it's like a, it's, think of it almost like a modern piece of paper, something like that, but it's made out of plants. Now, the durability of that's really difficult. So, About 100 years, right? 100 years, if it's an incredibly well-preserved like environment, a scroll. like a Dead Sea Scroll. And so if you put it in a clay jar that's sealed with wax and there's absolutely... Below sea level, yeah, driest place, on, dry place on, yeah. on earth. Okay, you, might, you can keep it. That's, but under that's, normal that's, a, that's an aberration, is what That's you're an aberration. Okay. Under normal usage, if you just had that in your house under normal usage, and if it was a book that you were using, yeah. you're going to... It's 10, 20 years, that's going to fall to pieces completely. 100 years is your absolute maximum life span for something like that under normal climatic so that's conditions. That's why we don't have the original. That's why we don't. And what we do have, and this is what's on the flip side. So people go, oh, so then the whole thing could have been written in like 500 or something. It's like, no, yeah. no, no, easy tiger. It's not like <laughs> that. What we do have is little fragments of bits where, you know, there might have been a piece of papyrus and the things crumble to pieces. And we might have like these two verses from Matthew. Yeah, yeah. And we have some of those things from the first century, little bits of things. And we we have things like people's writings who are quoting from it. And then once you get into the second century, we actually do start to get things like books and documents. Things like sometimes people inscribe things on leather as well, mm. which is much more durable. And then you start to get like books that are actually sort of like this being, like this sort of thing, which get preserved and heavily codices. looked after codices and things like okay. that. So and that's about the fourth century sure. where we By really begin to, to see whole century, Bibles. Whole yeah. Bibles, it's then. But little fragments you get from very early. But one of the, so we're not, no one's claim, no Christians claiming that we have like actual. What we have is little bits of it, but actually quite a lot of them. Yes. So it's as if hundreds, like hundreds, and, and then by the fourth century, thousands. Yeah, thousands, hundreds in the first two centuries. And of course, early church fathers' yeah, quotations. Yeah, they quote them all the time. The I mean, wait, we have twenty-one thousand. I mean, nineteen thousand yeah. eight hundred in eleven languages of yeah. translation. <laughs> I mean, it gets into the yeah. thousands and more. In some ways, and this is what I love. Um, Keith Small used to do this. He would yes. say, he, he, he said, the, the Bible is like this. It's an upside down pyramid. Yeah. From the very beginning, we. Uh, yeah. Pretty much everything was agreed upon at the yeah, very beginning. Yeah, yeah. And as you get on, you get more and more proliferation, yeah, enormous rich. amount yeah. of proliferation. Yeah. Now, I'm going to talk about this book. Ken, before you go into that book, just we do need to touch upon that because people like to say that we took many, many years to, um, the Bible evolved and took many, many years to come up with a consensus. And those oh, first three, right. four hundred years, okay. um, people yeah. were Do debating with each other. Um, okay. And yet we know that that ancient church together stood against the false heresies oh, that yeah. were coming up through the ranks. But talk a little bit about uh, that because we do need to touch upon that. it. Yeah. Just quickly on that, one of the things I always like to point out is um, 
What's that guy that wrote that Da Vinci Code book? Dan Brown. Dan Brown. Yeah, and, and since then people sort of go, and Muslims quote this too. Yes. too. I've had this discussion. They go, ah, oh, there were like dozens of these gospels about Jesus around. And then Constantine and the church using military power, you know, insisted that there were just these. Just, ju- just so you know, I mean, there is that famous video put out by Ahmad Didat where he said uh, there were 25 of these books put on a table <laughs> and they shook the table like this one. They shook it wow. back and forth. And what left remind was this book. <laughs> That's why we have it, and that, and that happened in in in, uh, the, in I think they say in uh, well fourth in three, century, fourth century yeah. three twenty five yeah three twenty five at the, the Council, Council of Nicaea, Nicaea. <laughs> they shook the table and what was left behind I'd love to okay. know where he got that story from but that has that's gone all over the Muslim hilarious. world and some of you are hey. going to hear this story okay, then. and you, 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 it's everything to so keep from hilarious. laughing because it's such a ridiculous story well why I give you what a killer just like why that cannot be true right take the four gospels that we have Matthew Mark Luke and John. And like who, you know, people debate when they were written, but sometime in the first century, no problem. There's a guy called Tatian, yes. and he lives sort of end of the first century to the second century. He put out a book. Roman historian. Roman historian, Christian guy. And what he did, and he was from sort of like Syria sort of place. And what he did is he put out oh, a sorry, book. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. I'm thinking of Tacitus. You are. I okay. knew you were, yeah. yeah. Forgive me. He's not Tacitus. Yeah. This is Tatian you're talking about. from Syria, really. Yeah. And he put out a book that's just called, he called it the Diatessaron, which means the one through the four. Mm. Through the four. And he doesn't even say the four what, because you're like, the four what? Mm. And what it is, so I tell you what it is, it's a compilation of the four Gospels to harmonise them. So he's like, here is the best of all the four Gospels woven together. So you've got like one one that gets like basically he weaves all the four gospels together but he doesn't even say these are the four gospels his book's just called the four because mm. everyone knows there are the four gospels so he he's talking even, to an yeah. audience that knew exactly what he they was talking exactly about and what, what is his date uh. and he's Might really early yes. yeah, yeah he's like the beginning of the second century mm. so he's within possibly 50 years mm. of yeah. the apostles writing all these things and he just writes a book that just goes here's the four and that's what together. you find when you do read the early yeah. church fathers. They're always just attesting to those four those or four to what was gospels, established yeah. as, as the word of God. And, and these letters of Paul and things like that, they just quote them all the time. What you, what these okay, stop and, and I mean, to me, yeah. this, is, this is hugely amazing. This is hugely important because right. what you're saying is already from by the early second century, they yeah. already knew that there were four gospels, oh, not 25 absolutely. like Muslims were talking about. That's what was so hilarious about your story yeah. because, you know, the shaking of this day, as if there were multiple, I'll give Another example. And they didn't have to explain it. It was it was Everyone common knowledge it. that there were four. Everyone knew it, and they could put out a book just going, "Here's that compilation of the four. And everyone goes, "Oh, the four gospels." They didn't. He did, and he doesn't have to do an intro at the beginning, saying, "Well, of course, there's all these 25 <laughs> other ones floating around, but I've selected these four. He doesn't need to do an See, intro. See, this is where Dan Brown really confused. Oh, him he's hilarious because he says there was a whole huge. Yeah. Uh, and he talks about the Gospel of Thomas. Yeah. And, okay. Oh, and gospel. those one. Here's what's interesting about those Gnostic Gospels. When they came out at the end of the second so century, this is and into after the, the Diatess run. Oh, way after that. Hugely yeah. important. Yeah, yeah, and they. I mean, they maybe begin around the end of the second. Yeah, end, end of the second. Really into the third. Yeah, it's is end of second off. into the third. These Gnostic Gospels come out. What's really interesting is church fathers, like leaders and bishops. Do reviews of them. Yes. Yeah. So they, they're they not as if like, oh, these have always been here. They're like, oh, here we go. It's another one of these weird little... And confront funny. them. Yeah, they confront yeah. them and review them. They and read they're them very, and say, they're yeah. very um, scathing against very them scathing. in their writing. Clearly yeah. disagree with them and disagree with what all those church leaders agreed yeah. with and knew from the apostles. Because you hear Muslims pull this up all the time from Dan yeah. Brown. And that's oh, why yeah. it's so important it's, that people listening yeah. to this, you need to know this. Yeah. You can just, just shut this down with a diet test around. That's a quick one. I haven't thought of that one. Can you just explain Gnostics, there'll be a lot of people okay. listening who don't understand what Gnostics so, are. The Gnostics is a kind of uh, religion that really began in Persia, and it's based on the idea that there's these secret mysteries to the universe, mm-hmm. and then like all these different levels of heaven, say, and that there are go- spiritual guardians, and you need to know this secret knowledge. To- so that the, a common version of it is, when you die, you will try to ascend through the heavens, and each level there'll be a password required. 
and do you have the secret knowledge to get past so that? So gnosis yeah. means knowledge. No, yeah, gnosis n means knowledge. It starts with so, G. Just yeah, sorry. G. Yeah, it's really gnosis. interesting that most heresies and even false religions actually focus on an idea of gnosis or, gnosis yeah, or, or knowledge. knowledge. Even thing. the Quran, the knowledge yes. thing is important. You can't really know Allah. You can't really yeah. understand what the Quran means. Yeah. It's almost like it's a magical, a mystical knowledge. knowledge. Yeah. yeah. So that was the idea of these Persian things. And then, of course, when they came across Christianity, the idea that Jesus came down from the heavens, they were like, ah, we can use this. He came down and gave the secret knowledge to secret people. So then they sort of co-opted aspects of Christianity into this whole idea of Gnosticism. So for, the, for a few hundred years, you had these versions that were like a synthesis of this Persian idea of secret knowledge in the heavens and the idea that Jesus came and gave it out. So but only to a like, few people, right? Yeah, only to so the it's elites. Quite, it's quite, it's, to elites. Yeah, it, yeah, it really separates people. It's it not really a message oh, for no. all people. Oh no, not at all. And they, know, they, they said, oh, certain people are born with this special ability to get the knowledge, mm. whereas everyone else doesn't. And then, you know, it's an elitist thing. Certainly in Shia Islam, you have a concept with the Imams and the 12 right. Imams. There seems to, if you read their, the theology that, that they are purported to have, yeah. have followed, um, it seems to be this sort of secret knowledge. And even that ah. latest 12 Imam, that was a bit of a secrecy around him, they don't know who he is and when he's coming back. And this idea of, of um, secret knowledge Isn't is a that, part of, of the Shia identity. That's so interesting because that's Persia again. Yes, yeah. These, the root, the place where Gnosticism was, mm. has retained a version of it in a way, in even Islam, and that has never been in knowledge. the Bible and has yeah, never no, 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 been no, no, in the no, no, early church. Because this is just on that when Irenaeus in the second century, he was a sort of guy from Turkey who went to plant churches in France, and his whole point is like I was trained by a guy who was trained by the Apostle John. <laughs> and if anyone knew any secret knowledge, I'd know it because no, because I was trained by you know. They, mm. I've never read. There is no secret knowledge, and I, everybody I've spoken to was trained by apostles. They don't have any secret knowledge. This is just rubbish. What we have is this stuff. Let's read this. It's all out in the open in all these different languages. Mm. Read it. It's all there for everybody to see. The secrets are out. Jesus is yeah. the secret made known. So when you look right. at these two books. And we've got five minutes left. So let's do it. Let's this do is part one. Let's we'll do, do part two in the let's next Let's do a show. review because we're not even getting to the Quran yet. We're we not do, even there. We'll do that in the next <laughs> we, we, segment. We love the Bible. We keep talking about the Bible. But just take a look and you yeah. see already we're Huge. talking about two different yes. books, aren't we? Oh, it's a different yeah. universe. This book, we don't yes. make the claim they make. No. They, they And see, this is where we're going to hammer them now in the next the next episode. We're going to destroy this book because the claim every Muslim makes. Now, you Muslims that are watching this, you do make this claim. Regardless whether you're a radical, nominal, or liberal, you all make this claim that this is eternal. Yeah. This is not eternal. Yeah. You make this claim that it was sent down to one man named Muhammad over a 22-year period. We would not say that this book was sent down to anybody. No. Uh, but you make this claim that this was complete. But when was it complete? Now, that's interesting. Yeah. You fake, just the first one was complete in 632, 634 uh, at the time of Abu Bakr, uh, according to Al-Buhari, chapter 6. Hadith number 509510. Abu Bakr went to was write it down. He He's, wanted to write it down. And he had a man yes. named Zaidi bin Thabit, who's a secretary of Muhammad, who finally writes it down after Muhammad's dead. Why didn't he write while he was living? Yeah. If he's a secretary, what do secretaries do? Yeah. They're supposed to read yeah. and write, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a huge question that no one's answered me today. I've, I've asked that for years. Why didn't Zayda bin Thabit write it down as he heard it? Yeah. I mean, what else did he write? Yeah. I mean, that was the one function that a prophet is supposed to give, is to receive a revelation. Yeah. For, you know, it's really inept. Of, I, yeah. I have to be careful. It's inept of Muhammad for not having it written down. Nonetheless, that still wasn't good enough because he gave that to Hafsa, one of the wives of, Mah of Muhammad's. And she put her under her bed, and about 20 years later, around 652 now we're talking about, Uthman is the caliph at that time, the third caliph. He then has that taken out by Zaidi bin Thabit and rewritten a second time. So Jay, you've got three minutes to okay, wrap this up. Okay, can you see, right yeah. minute, there's a huge difference. We are talking about two different con contexts we, of revelation. I can't wait for the next program where you really open these issues up. And I'm just studying it up for that. And we're challenging this because if there are over a quarter of the world's population follow this book, the Quran, but if it isn't from God, then they're following a book that isn't from God, which means they're not following God. Yeah. And that's why this is important, isn't it, Jay? Yeah. That's why I get we back want to, this, to challenge this book. We want to bring David. it back to the real yeah. one. We're talking yes. about two different texts. Yeah, this totally. one we never claim is original. No. It, I mean, we don't have the originals. It no, is original, but yeah. we don't have the originals. Yeah. But we have such a textual history for yeah, it. Amazing. And that's one reason why we can pretty much be assured of what we do have is from the original. Yeah. 
we're going to find out that they claim that this is a result. Wait till the next episode. Oh. We're going to destroy that. Also, we would not claim, we, we, this was written in a language that everybody could yeah. understand. Yeah. This was written in a language that nobody could understand. Only yeah, the yeah. Arabs could understand That's so it, weird. which is really inept of God. Yeah, yeah. Written to a man who couldn't even read and write. Yeah. And to in a, a man language who, that barely existed for general exactly, years. Exactly. Couldn't yeah. even accommodate it. It I took know. another hundred years before they could even accommodate it yeah. so we could read it. Can you see, already we're talking about two different two texts, different. two different and views of Revelation. My sort of, if I wanted to make a sort of closing thing about this, is this book with all those manuscripts and all the variants we have from all over the world and so when people study very closely the text of the new testament say they'll find that you know there'll be thousands of these different little scraps and manuscripts and bits and then they'll compare them all and they'll say oh like this word here like you in this verse <laughs> there's actually two or three small variants over that and there's thousands of it. and there are people who just live their life comparing all these little variants of all the different manuscripts and so some people go oh so there are like all these little variants we can't know absolutely which particular spelling of that word matthew used and i'm like yeah i guess you know in terms of actual teaching and doctrine and truth. There's Hold on a minute. To... We're going to talk about variants in the next episode. Okay, we'll get into that. Wait till you find out how many variants there are on this one. Okay, that, uh, that'll be amazing. And it isn't just but... spelling variants in okay, the Quran. Because in this, it's the Bible. Just, yeah. it's, it's very... Wait hardly till you anything. see what okay. we're going to introduce. But hold the, that for the next episode. I will episode. hold that. But what I suppose I'll end with this point yeah. then is, wh why, why that doesn't stress out Christians? Because you think, well, why aren't Christians really stressed about all these tiny little fragments and trying to make sure, you know, that because, and this is a deep point, and we might get into this again in a later one, but for a, like for a Muslim, that is the revelation of yeah. Allah. This actually isn't the revelation of this living God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The perfect and immaculate revelation of the living God is... Jesus Christ himself. Okay, one step further, is Jesus eternal? Yeah. Was he Jesus sent down? Yeah. Was he complete? Yeah. Has he ever changed? No. Exactly. The four things they claim about this all come back to Jesus. Well, why don't they just believe in Jesus then? <laughs> Brilliant. We'll end on that. Thank you, um, Paul and Jay, for this very interesting discussion. Stay tuned for the next part because it's getting even more interesting. See you soon.